including the Underground Railroad, um, that, that you might find useful. So if you have a pencil and paper handy, and Sandy will also try and put them in the chat space. So we have three stories to tell tonight, and they're each kind of complicated research-wise. So uh, if you have a question, I might stop after the first story, or I might, if I have momentum, just keep going, because they're all interconnected. They're definitely interconnected. And then we'll take questions and comments at the end. But if you, if you think about something, just put it in the chat as a question as we move along. Um, again, there's three stories. They're interconnected, but they're really quite different stories. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Kara Legba. I'm the historian for Oakland County uh, Parks and Recreation. So what I'm going to share tonight is some of my research I've been doing. It is uh, uh, connected to some things we're trying to do in the county on Black History Month. But I'm a firm believer that Black history does, doesn't need to be stuck in one month. I think it's a great time to celebrate it, but I think we, we, we think about the connections with Black history all during the time. So let me just start with that. All right, I am going to share my screen because this one has loads of information in it. So let me just start. And I'm hoping everybody can see. All right, now let me go back one time. Again, this is part of our fireside chat series. At the end, I'll give you some information and invite you to the, uh, the next one. So as park historian, uh, my job really is to figure out the history of 14 different pieces of land, and some of them are pretty big. They're all park lands, but my job is to figure out who, who were the people who called the park lands home at one time? What were the farms that were there? What's the indigenous history? So that's really what I spend time doing. So tonight, what I wanted to do is really tell three stories. Um, the Oh, I might have to stash my dog here in a minute. Um, the first one's going to be about the Underground Railroad, and we'll talk a little bit about that. Then the next one is a person I discovered called Henry Jenkins. And finally, one second, I'm going to have to let my dog out. Looks like it's uh, the problem of zooming at home. And finally, a place, a place called Medicine Acres. Um, each of these, I think you're going to find, uh, in particular, Henry Jenkins and Medicine Acres, are probably new information for you, even if you know a lot about Oakland County history. So those are the three stories. And once again, my job, I've been really trying to do more research on the connections between African American history and the parks. And that's what we're going to talk about tonight. I want to start with context. To a historian, context is the background, the backdrop, the setting for a story. And it's very important because it helps us understand the story better. So I'm going to start with some context about African Americans in Oakland County early on. And I'm going to start with this primary source. This is a document, primary document. It's from 1825. Oh and what it registers is the sale of a piece of land from Stephen Mack to Elizabeth Dennison. The land that was sold was right here in the village of Pontiac. Uh, 1825 Pontiac was very small, but it was four pieces of land called four village lots, but they weren't small. Altogether, it was 46 acres. Now think for a minute. A woman in 18... There we go. There we go. Now you can, I got muted for a minute. So in itself, the fact that a woman was purchasing land that early on was unique. What's even more unique is that Elizabeth Dennison was African-American. You can see even in the D, it said paid for by Elizabeth Dennison, a woman of color. So even on the technical D, 
it was noticed that she was different. She was a woman of color. She was the first African-American woman to purchase land in Oakland County. In fact, unless records are there that I can't find, she was the first African-American woman to purchase land in the entire Michigan territory. So she's an interesting person. Now, Elizabeth Dennison was born enslaved, but not in Virginia, not in Alabama. Elizabeth was born in the 1780s, right here along the Clinton River in what later on would become Macomb County. She was enslaved by the William Tucker family. Later on, she'd be moved to the Detroit area where she was enslaved by another family. So she had an interesting, interesting beginning. Her story is told in a short book by Isabella Spahn called Lizette. This hopefully is gonna be reprinted by the Oakland History Center uh, with a new foreword written by uh, DeWitt Dykes, the professor of African-American history at OU, which I'm excited to hear. If you wanna read it though, before that, I have a PDF version of Lizette that I'd be happy to email you. It's not a, a, a big, long book at all. Here's another recommendation. This is Taya Miles' a fairly new book called The Dawn of Detroit. This is a chronicle of slavery in early Detroit. It was an eye opener for me. First of all, Taya Miles is an amazing writer. She's a historian, but she has a gift for writing that often historians don't have. There's several uh, uh, sections of chapters that are about Elizabeth Dennison, who later on became Elizabeth Dennison Poor when she married. So I would highly recommend this book if you want to learn more about not only Elizabeth Dennison Poor, but about the evolution and the use of slavery in early Detroit. Now, Elizabeth Dennison Poor never lived in uh, Oakland County. Uh, she spent her, her life in Detroit, so she wouldn't appear in the 1830 census. However, her brother, Scipio Dennison, and his family did live on her land. They were early residents of, of Oakland County, but they weren't the first African Americans that I found in Oakland County. Actually, in the 1820 census, the John Wilson family was listed. It appears that John Wilson had a white wife and had about four children. Um, they're also listed in the 1830 census, and then I've lost them. I'm working on trying to find more about the John Wilson family, but that appears to be the first family that's listed in the census. Now, 1830, this, the federal census listed 19 African Americans in Oakland County. By 1840, there were 56, 1850, 64, 1860, 309, and 1870, 465. So think about that for a minute. Think about, do you think these numbers were accurate? My guess, no. I think this is an undercount particularly after 1850. Think about the fact that the Fugitive Slave Act, and we're gonna talk more about that, that essentially um, resulted in any freedom seeker who had made it to, to Michigan could be taken back to the South. It made assisting a freedom seeker illegal. So I'm thinking that if I made all the way to Michigan, I certainly didn't want to be counted at that time. So probably these numbers are, are really, really much smaller than they were. Now, who were these people? Who were the African-Americans that were early settlers in Oakland County? Well, if you look at the Oakland County 1877 history that was written, they featured the stories of lots of different people. There were actually 125 stories of people. However, zero were African-Americans. So the stories are not there. If you read this book cover to cover, you would not even have any inkling that African-Americans even were in Oakland County from the beginning. In 1891, the portrait and biographical album came out. 
It featured prominent representative citizens of Oakland County. There were 640 stories of people, zero were African-American. And yet it said that it was representative of Oakland County. So the issue has been often the stories of African-Americans have been left out of our histories. It's true in American history also, but it's certainly true of, of Oakland County. And, and one of my missions research-wise is to try and uncover some of those stories, which I'll show tonight. So that's kind of beginning context. The important point is African-Americans were part of Oakland County history from the time we became a county in 1820. Here's another recommendation. This is the bone and sinew of the land. This is about early African-American settlers in the Northwest Territory, uh, including the Michigan Territory. There's a wonderful section on the Harris family of Kalamazoo County. So this is a part of history that often isn't covered. If African-American settlers are covered, it tends to be after the Civil War. This is the early folks who were here. And again, another good book recommendation. Well, now first story, it's gonna take us down here in the Southwest of Oakland County to Catalpa Oaks County Park. And my question we're gonna be discovering is, what's the connection between Catalpa Oaks County Park and the Underground Railroad? Because I discovered an interesting one. Let me start with a little context though. Most of you know that the Underground Railroad was a loose network of people and places with a purpose, sole purpose of getting freedom seekers from the South into the North. First big step being the crossing of the Ohio River, which formed the boundary between the slave states and the free states. There were two large sweeping routes into Detroit one coming this way, one coming that way. But particularly after 1850, the goal was not Detroit, the goal was Canada. And that's because the British Empire had, uh, had eliminated and abolished slavery in 1834. Canada, of course, was part of the British Empire. So particularly after the Fugitive Slave Act, the goal was getting into Canada, which of course made Michigan a very part important part of the Underground Railroad system. Now in Oakland County, we attempted to tell something of the role Oakland County played in the Underground Railroad in this map. The map that we, it was done during the sesquicentennial of the Civil War was designed to talk about the role Oakland County played in the Civil War. However, we did include on the map, the map had some connections to the Underground Railroad. It was only a, a beginning, but it, at least it gives us some foundation of what, how was Oakland County connected? So one of the things that were marked on the map were Underground Railroad sites that have a Michigan historical marker in Oakland County. There are four of them down here in the Farmington area. And most of you know that Farmington was a a Quaker settlement, began as a Quaker settlement. And then in West Bloomfield, there's the Emmendorfer House. Now, one thing to think about is just because a Underground Railroad site has a Michigan historical marker, doesn't necessarily mean that the documentation has been completely done. There are issues with some of the Michigan markers. The Emmendorfer House, for example, um, some people are beginning to concern on the lack of, of documentation on that particular house. But again, we'll, we'll see how, why that's a problem. The other thing that was marked on the map were what uh, Underground Railroad sites are called lore sites. Those are word of mouth sites. Those are sites that really don't have a primary source set of documentation, but oral tradition says this was on the Underground Railroad. Now there are a lot of them in Oakland County that qualify for that category, but there's only one mark on this particular map. And that's the Banks, the Banks Dolber Historic Home in Wald Lake. This is being renovated. There's a lot of new research going on on this particular house. And finally, there was a site mark 
that's fully documented with primary source documentation as being connected to the Underground Railroad. And that happens to be in Southfield. And it's the Southfield Reform Presbyterian Church. And that's actually the site I'm gonna talk about tonight. Now think about it though. We know there was more involvement in the Underground Railroad in Oakland County than what is shown on this map. Why is it so difficult to document? How, why is it hard to prove that that was true? Well, here's one of my favorite quotes. Where do we find evidence for a historical phenomenon that was for the most part unwritten and sometimes even unspoken? Remember for obvious reasons, this was a, 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 secret, a, a secret institution. It, you didn't talk about the fact that you were involved because it was an illegal, uh, a, a legal, illegal system that was operating. So paper trails are not there often. We're gonna see where there is a document and the incredible power of one document that helped document the church that we're gonna talk about. So that takes us to Catalpa. Catalpa, you can see, is this little body of green amidst all this residential neighborhood. And my initial goal with Catalpa was to try and figure out who had lived on the land before it became a park. When I do that, I always start with this book. This is available at Ancestry, or sorry, at Amazon. And it's a book of maps. And for each township, it shows who the first property owners were, the first people to buy the land from the federal government. Now, a word of caution, we know that those people who divided up this map into squares and bought it were not the first folks. We know that indigenous people were in Michigan, in strong in, uh, indigenous pres presence in Southfield Township. We know that they were there obviously first. If you wanna see a good display, go to the Southfield Historical Museum. They have a wonderful display on the Potawatomi uh, and their connections to Southfield. But remember, indigenous people had a different view of the land. They believed you couldn't own it. You didn't divide it up into little squares and rectangles and sell it to each other. It was a different perspective. So when Europeans came to the area, their perspective of land was we divide it up, we sell it, we get a piece of paper that says we own this piece of land. So I did start though with section 13, which is where our park is located. And then you can see section 13, and here's our park. Andrew Taylor owned about half of what became Catalpa Oaks, and he purchased that land in 1835. John McClellan lived right next door and really owned the rest of the land that contained Catalpa. And once again, it was 1835. But what I found out, the real story that I uncovered was about David Stewart, who owned the land just to the north. I learned that David Stewart had come to Southfield in 1831. He was a covenanter a leader in the Reformed Presbyterian Church. And in 1834, he founded a Covenanter congregation in Southfield. Now the Covenanter Church is an interesting one. It's an old Christian sect that precedes the, uh, the American Revolution in our country. And it was, oops, let me just get back here. It was one of the earliest religious organizations to take a firm position against slavery. You know, we always think of the Quakers, but the Covenanter Church was very strongly anti-slavery to the extent that you, if you were a member of the Covenanter Church, you, were, you could not own slaves. So it was a strong anti-slavery group. And this was a group, the church that David Stewart started in 1834 in Southfield. Now it turned out though, he was connected to the other two people I was researching. Andrew Taylor turned out to be his son-in-law and he was another member of the Covenanter Church. John McClellan was himself another Covenanter leader 
And the three of them had come together to Southfield area. But there were more than these three families. Now, let me give you, before we go on, let me give you geographically where we're talking about. Here's 12 Mile, here's 11 Mile, and here's Evergreen. So we're talking about that little section of Southfield. Now, other families, the Parks family, John Parks coming first. He was another son-in-law of David Stewart. We had the James McClellan, the son of John McClellan. We had the McClung family. We had the McKinney family. We had the McLaughlin family and the Irwin family. All of them had essentially followed David Stewart to Southfield, all of them members of the Covenanter Church. Now, by the 1840s, they had a building. Before 1840s, they were meeting in each other's houses. By 1840, they had built a small church on Mr. Parks's land. By 1860, they would replace it with a larger building. Now, here was my question. They had clearly belonged to an anti-slavery church where they had come from, and most of them had come from Pennsylvania or New York. But had they maintained those sentiments when they got here? Were they still anti-slavery? Well, I needed proof. You know, historians need a primary source that proves something. And the proof came in the farm up here. The farm there, that green farm, was owned by Reverend J.S.T. Milligan. Reverend Milligan was the head of the Covenanter Church from 1853 in Southfield until 1871. And he left behind a letter. He wrote it in 1895, but it was autobiographical about his involvement in the Covenanter Church. And in that letter, he said, I was first settled as pastor in Southfield, Michigan, 16 miles from Detroit, in a good community of people, mainly abolitionists. So it appears when these people came to Michigan, they did take their anti-slavery sentiments with them. Another piece of proof. This is the Liberator magazine, or sorry, Liberator newspaper. This was the primary abolitionist paper in the United States at the time. The Liberators, uh, by the way, is online now great source for information about the abolition movement. But within the Liberator in 1858, there was a, a, a letter from William C. Nell, an announcement, who talked about going to do a series of anti-slavery meetings in Michigan. His first stop was Detroit. And when he left Detroit, he said, I left from there to go to Southfield to see Reverend Milligan and his faithful band of Covenanters. And it was in the Covenanter church that he gave several anti-slavery lectures. Again, further proof that this group had maintained their anti-slavery stance. Now, however, being an abolitionist, being an anti-slavery person didn't mean you were involved in the Underground Railroad. There were lots of people who were against slavery, but never got actively involved. So the question was, did these folks get involved in the Underground Railroad in addition to the abolitionist feelings? Also in his letter, he said, and had in my house or in my congregation always a supply of escaped slaves. So here was proof within his letter that the congregation was actively involved in helping freedom seekers in the Michigan area. Further evidence. Oh wait, first let, let me talk about the, um, the, uh, the fugitive slave law. Fugitive slave of course was passed in 1850. And this did change what was happening in Michigan at the time. Because it, from that time it made it law that any escaped persons found in free states had to be returned to their owners. On top of that, it increased the penalties for those who were helping freedom seekers. So it essentially made it illegal to assist. So it became a more dangerous institution to be involved in. Also at that time, of course, is when it became so critical 
to get into Canada. That made Reverend Milligan and his congregation very, very important. And why? Their proximity to Detroit. It was at that time, people who were attempting, the people who had come from the South to try and grab freedom seekers and return them to the South, they were often in Detroit. So it was safer sometimes to have people outside of Detroit until the last minute and then move them into Detroit. Another very interesting thing in his letter, for the most part, people who left behind information on the Underground Railroad never left the names of the people they'd helped escape. Sometimes they didn't know them. Um, for obvious reasons, sometimes people didn't give them in. They, they didn't include them in documentation. But Reverend Milligan did. He left evidence regarding a, a freedom seeker named John Sella Martin. He'd been enslaved in Alabama, made his way to Chicago, where a thousand dollar reward had been put on his head. He left Chicago and he ended up in Southfield. And according to Reverend Milligan's letter, he spent six weeks in the house of Reverend Milligan. And as Reverend Milligan said, he was the smartest man I ever met. He eventually made his way to Canada after the six weeks. He did return to the United States and became a very eloquent speaker in the abolitionist movement. But what was so cool was we finally have a name of someone who was here in Michigan, who was protected by this congregation and then did make it to Canada. Now, where was the letter from? How did the letter surface? It's part of what we call the Wilbert Siebert Underground Railroad Collection. And it was sent to William Siebert in 1895 by Reverend Milligan. William Siebert was a historian and he decided that there was lack of documentation on the Underground Railroad, and he began an effort to put documentation together. It was the first really documented survey of the Underground Railroad. It has excerpts from diaries, letters, biographies, speeches, and other firsthand accounts. It is in book form, you can find it. It's also, the whole book is digitized online but it's an amazing collection of primary source material. He actually spent 50 years doing the, the, the book he published uh, in the 1890s, the initial book, but he continued for the next 50 years to gather data. Most of that additional information is at the Ohio State University in the Siebert collection. Now, what about the church? The church is still there. Now, this is the second church. This is the 1860 church, but it's on the site of the, uh, of the earlier church, which most likely did, uh, did serve as a haven for freedom seekers. There's a wonderful plaque there explaining the role of the congregation in the Underground Railroad. So again, I just started to try and figure out who had been farming the land, before Catalpa Oaks. But I uncovered this amazing story of this group of farmers, essentially, who believed so strongly that slavery was wrong, that they got actively involved in what was an illegal movement, the Underground Railroad. Now, one final book before we move on to story two. This is Carol Mall's The Underground Railroad in Michigan. There are loads of excellent books on the Underground Railroad. This is unique because it's specifically about Michigan. Very readable, very well documented. So again, I put this on your book list. And now next story, since we're on a roll, if you have a question about what we just covered, jot it down, we'll get back to it. But let's move along because it's another connected story. And it's going to take us up to the Northwest to Holly Oaks, which is our ORV park, and Groveland Oaks, which is uh, one of our, our uh, parks that happens to have a campground. And the question we're going to look at is who was Henry Jenkins? Let me start with some context. In 
Remember that um, in 1860, there were 309 African-Americans listed in the census in Oakland County. By, by 1870, the number hadn't grown very much. I fully believe that it, it, for, it was, it, it's, a, it's a low number. But I was curious about who were some of the people who were in Oakland County in 1870. And the census gives us some interesting glimpses of the lives of these people. This is George Moore family. George Moore and his family lived in Pontiac. And you'll see that George and his wife and four of his children were born in Virginia. The last one being Mary who was born in 1858. And then two of his children, Joseph and Harriet, were born in Canada. The last three children, Charlie, Washington, and Henry, were born in Michigan. Now, what does this tell us? Well, I'd make the inference that George Moore and his family had been enslaved in Virginia, had made their way around 1858 to Canada via the Underground Railroad, and had returned to, to, to the United States, to Michigan. I found at least five families living in Pontiac that have the same type of information. So that gives us a glimpse of the fact that sometimes people came back for a variety of reasons. They returned to the United States. But as you'll see, I learned another story in the 1870 census about an African-American. And that takes us to Hollyoaks ORV Park and Groveland Oaks. They're across the street from each other and they're right along Dixie Highway. But the story really begins right here. This is a little historic cemetery called Hadley Cemetery. Hadley Cemetery is a private cemetery. It's been lovingly cared for since the 1840s by the Little Hadley Cemetery Association. It's a very historic cemetery. And it's one that has the very best cemetery records I have ever seen. Most often when you have an old historic cemetery and you ask to see the records, you'll hear, well, we, they're lost. They were burned at this year. We're not sure where they're at. This cemetery association has held on to their records literally since the 1860s. And I had the great pleasure of working with them, going through some of these records, just to see what stories we could find within them. As I was doing that, I discovered Henry Jenkins. He died on June 7th of 1877. And I realized Henry Jenkins was African-American. Notice the word used in the time, quote, colored, unquote but they'd actually in his burial record notated that he was African-American. Well, I knew from my work in the census, there were very few African-Americans in Northern Oakland County. So I got interested in Henry Jenkins. I was curious where he'd been buried. I wanted to visit his grave so that I could see what might be on his tombstone. Over on the right, here's where for the cemetery records, the lot numbers are, the burial lot. But you'll notice next to Henry Jenkins, you have just two letters, P, F. That stood for Potter's Field. Now, what was a Potter's Field? That was, according to most old cemeteries, where unknown, unclaimed, or indigenous people were buried. These were people often from someplace else, people who didn't have a family, um, and in this case, the community would pay for a very simple burial. The Potter's Field was marked on the Hadley Cemetery map. And it happened to be right along the main cemetery road, right along Dixie Highway. Now, this was a bit unusual. When I'd been researching Potter's Fields and other old cemeteries, they were usually at the back of the cemetery in a little corner tucked away. But for some reason, the people here for Hadley Cemetery had put it in a very, very 
important spot in the front of the cemetery. I wish I knew who'd made that decision because it's unique. But that became the final resting place of Henry Jenkins. I knew I had to find out more. I went to the 1870 census for Groveland and there was Henry Jenkins. He was living, in the, uh, living on the farm of George Leland and working as a farm laborer. Well, of course, my next step, I needed to find out where that farm was. Here's the Groveland 1872 map. And here was the farm of George Leland. It's right along what today is McGinnis Road. Um, McGinnis is parallel, one mile to the south of Grange Hall Road and parallel. And interestingly enough, the Leland Farm where Henry Jenkins was living and working is one mile from Groveland Oaks County Park, which is why I became so fascinated with him. Now I checked local, I checked old papers to see if I could find out about Henry Jenkins, maybe what had caused his death. I looked in the Oakland County history book. Of course, as I predicted, he wasn't there. I looked in newspapers for George Leland. I looked in the history book, also again, in the history book for George Leland, but I just kept coming up with dead ends. I couldn't find anything about either of them. But then I remember, I had seen the 1877 Oakland County death records. They're actually at ancestry.com. So I looked up Groveland Township. There were six people who died in Groveland in 1877, but unfortunately, Henry Jenkins was not listed. Another dead end. I went back to the 1870 census. What else could it tell me? Here it said Alabama. He was born, he was 21, so he would have been born in Alabama in 1850. Hmm, let me think, I said, what are the odds that he was enslaved in Alabama? So I looked up the census records for 1850 in Alabama. And if you see the numbers, less than 1% of the African-Americans in Alabama were free in 1850. So I realized that Henry Jenkins was most likely, highly likely, had been enslaved in Alabama before coming to Michigan. But what else did I have to work with? Ah, I had his last name. Many of you have probably heard, and I've run into it frequently, many Africans, enslaved Africans, were forced to take the last name of the person who owned them. So I said, it's highly likely that Henry Jenkins would have been enslaved on a Jenkins plantation, which took me to this document. This was, uh, it shows the large slave owners, the people who didn't own two or three slaves, a lot of, a lot of people did, but those who owned um, uh, uh, several slaves for 1860. And it has the, by state, and then once you get to the state, it has by county. I literally went county by county. And when I finally got to Wilcox County near the end, I found the only Jenkins on the list, a TJ Jenkins who owned 39 slaves. Later, I would learn that he was actually a medical doctor also, but he had a small plantation. This is the 1860 slave schedule. This is a, a, within the, the federal census. You'll notice enslaved people were nameless. They didn't even put their names on here. All they're listed as is their age, their gender. And I noticed Thomas Jenkins had three young African males aged 10 in 1860. These three would have been born in 1850. I'm convinced that one of them was Henry Jenkins. Now, do I have proof? No. But the pieces are good inference that likely Henry Jenkins, being from Alabama, would have been one of these three young enslaved boys. Now imagine, 
Here's Wilcox County, Southern Alabama. It was a long way from Alabama to Michigan. I believe that after the Civil War was over, Henry would have been about 15. And some way he made his way to Michigan. Um, it, it wouldn't have been the Underground Railroad because he was in Alabama in 18, I'm convinced he was in Alabama in 1860, but later found his way. Now, why Groveland? How did he end up here in Groveland? I think it was the Saginaw Turnpike. I think it was the same way a bunch of people ended up in Groveland and Holly Townships. People got to Detroit and then they took that what became the Saginaw Turnpike out to the Northwest into Oakland County. That's the most likely way. Now, did he come by himself? I think if he was 15, he may have, but I think likely there were probably family members also, but I don't know that. Really, all I know is that this was his final resting place. I don't know how he died. I don't know family members that came with him. I certainly have some work to do around that. So I really am only beginning to know the surface story of Henry Jenkins. And the reality is for many African-Americans in Oakland County early on, their stories were not written down. They weren't treasured like the stories of other folks. They were essentially forgotten. And that gives us a real reason to work harder so that the stories of people like Henry Jenkins become part of our histories. So as you can see, he's a fascinating person, but we've only touched the surface. Now my third story. This is gonna take us to Rose Oaks County Park, up there in the Northwest corner. If you've never been to Rose Oaks, you just have to drive out, it's beautiful in, in spring. There is no water park there, there is no concession stand. There are trails and bathrooms, and that's about it. But it is a beautiful, beautiful park. And the question we're going to look at is what was Medicine Acres? Now, let me start with some context. The red uh, rectangle there, almost a square, is Rose Township. Main roads, Milford Road, and Rose Center Road. And you'll see for a while, they're both the same road. Here happens to be our Rose Oaks County Park. So this is the area. Once I was researching Rose Oaks County Park, I always decide to do some more research on the township itself. A little data. The population in 2020, according to the federal census, is only 6,000 in Rose. 43 people in the census were listed as African-American and 17 as biracial. So you can see it's a fairly white township. Historically, it developed along this road. This road at the time uh, in the 1830s was known as the White Lake Road. It really was formerly a Native American trail, similarly to the Saginaw Trail that began as a Native American trail. This trail turned into a rough wagon road and along it right here, a little village called Buckhorn started. Buckhorn began literally as a tavern, a Gage's Tavern, a, a little hotel. There were several along the White Lake Road because it took so long to get from one place to another in those days. Not long after the hotel, it had a little store and it eventually had a blacksmith shop and not much more until 1871. And that was when the Holly Wayne and Monroe Railroad came through Rose Township and things changed. The commercial center of Rose, which wasn't much of a commercial center, but it moved down the road to where the road crossed the railroad track. And Rose Center was born. By 1878, Rose Center had a depot. That same year, it had a store. By 1881, it had a town hall, the, the Rose Township Hall. And houses began to develop, began to grow in Little Rose Center. 
But the biggest change in Rose Center was a new economic activity, ice harvesting. Rose Center had two things that made it perfect for ice harvesting. It had a great big lake, Buckhorn Lake, and right next to it, it had a railroad. And before long, a series of ice houses had been built in Rose Center, even a big boarding house and the ice industry developed. Now by the 1930s, ice harvesting was over. Refrigeration and refrigerators had killed ice harvesting. And the land where the ice houses had been was purchased by Floyd Wooten, who'd been the superintendent of ice harvesting company in Rose, in Rose Center. Soon after, he purchased more land, up until about 180 acres in all. And he owned that through the 1930s. He built a huge, beautiful house on the land. Beautiful outside, beautiful and ornate inside. Now, by the 1940s, the Wooten sold the land. They sold it to Mrs. D. Northcross, who happened to be African-American. She was actually Dr. Daisy Northcross. Dr. Daisy Northcross was born in Montgomery, Alabama in 1881. In 1899, she had trained as a teacher and was teaching in Montgomery. By 1902, she had finished her bachelor's degree at Temple University in Philadelphia. In 1909, she returned to Montgomery and she married a young doctor named Dr. David Northcross. By 1913, she had completed her own medical degree at Bennett Medical College in Chicago and she had returned to Montgomery. She was only the second woman to apply and be granted a physician's license in Alabama. In 1916, they made the decision to move to Detroit. They were part of what we call the great migration of African-Americans from the South into the urban centers of the North. By one year later, they had started, they had constructed, they, they, they had built Mercy General Hospital, which was Detroit's first black owned and operated hospital. It started as a small building they rented. Eventually, they uh, built a bigger, uh, a bigger building. Now, why their own hospital? Well, when the North Crosses got to Detroit, they realized that segregation-wise, it wasn't that different than the South. They found that many white hospitals turned away African-American patients. Those that they admitted were put on inferior wards. It was very difficult for an African-American physician to function in a white-owned hospital. So the North Crosses decide to operate their own hospital in Detroit. The hospital was located right here, right now near where Ford Field is and the Chrysler Freeway. They also owned a small hotel, the North Cross Hotel in the same area. They opened the hotel for the same reason they opened the hospital segregated accommodations in Detroit. Now, sadly, in 1933, Dr. David Northcross was stabbed and killed by one of his tenants. He had gone to see the tenant over an issue he had with him and at that time was killed by the tenant. Daisy, however, kept the hospital going, becoming administrator of the hospital herself, their daughter, Gloria, became in charge of medical records and much of the administration paperwork. Their son, Dr. David Northcross Jr., became one of the two house physicians in the hospital. So even though the original Dr. David was, uh, was gone, the family kept the hospital going. In the 1940s, it was Dr. Daisy Northcross who purchased the 180, 180 acres from the Wooten family. Now, according to newspaper articles I saw, they initially called their land their farm. And there were articles that said 
the family had spent the week up on their farm. In here, that people had visited Dr. Daisy Northcross's delightful farm. I found more than one case and something very interesting. One article even said that Gloria Northcross, their daughter, was making a success at her poultry business on the 100 acre farm of her mother. Now I couldn't find anything else about that, but I'm wondering what, what business, what, what kind of poultry business? There has to be a, a paper trail there somewhere. I just haven't found it. Now, interestingly enough, their farm was really a very historic farm. From the 1850s, it had been the farm of Charles Pratt. Now, Charles Pratt has an interesting connection to history. Oh, first of all, the Charles Pratt farmhouse is still there, which means when Daisy Northcross bought the land, not only did she get the big, beautiful mansion house that the Wootons had, but she also would have had Charles Pratt's farmhouse because it's still there now, and likely some of the farm buildings, which is why I think they called it the farm. And probably this was the place where Gloria Northcross was running her poultry business. But back to Charles Pratt. Some of you may be familiar with Sarah Emma Edmonds. Sarah Emma Edmonds was born, born in, in Canada. She ran away from home when her father wanted to marry her off to someone. And she disguised herself as Frank Thompson. She would enlist out of Flint and become a soldier in the Civil War. She has quite a story. She's usually attributed to Flint, but this article from the Lansing State Journal says actually, when she got to Michigan, she actually went first to Rose Township. And she worked as a farm laborer on the farm of Charles Pratt. So Rose has a wonderful connection with the Charles Pratt farm and the Civil War soldier, Frank Thompson. But back to Medicine Acres. How did that come about? By the late 1940s, early 1950s, Daisy had started to call her land Medicine Acres and had turned it into a resort. She used the large house, used the dining room of the house as a guest dining room. And she built the series of small cabins right along Buckhorn Lake it became an important African-American resort. The cabins, by the way, are still there. It was called Medicine Acres, and it had horseback riding, speed boating, fishing, croquet, softball, and golf, and a runabout for a sightseeing tour. Oh, I would just love to know where in Rose Township they took their sightseeing tour. Some of you may be familiar with the Green Book. Uh, you know, a movie came out that, that mentioned this book and more people became familiar with it. This was a traveler's guide, but it allowed African-American travelers in the mid 1900s to safely navigate a segregated nation. It was first published in 1936 and actually published up through 1967. And it listed places where African-Americans could safely stay. And there in the book under Michigan was Rose Center and Medicine Acres. So it was listed in the green book. Now, I had heard about the other <clears throat> famous Michigan resort, Idlewild. Some of you may have heard of that. Idlewild was located here in Northwestern Michigan. It's just to the west of Ludington. There's lots of information online about Idlewild. Um, it was actually started by some white entrepreneurs, realizing that it might be lucrative for them to start an African-American resort since African-Americans weren't welcome at white resorts. There's some wonderful information on Idlewild. If you're familiar with the images of America book, there's a, a nice uh, collection on, in uh, photos in this one on Idlewild. So I knew Idlewild, but I noticed the other area that seemed to have more than one 
accommodation for African Americans was a place called Bitly and a, uh, a resort called Woodland Park. Now, I had never heard of Bitly, Michigan. I had to look it up. It turns out that Bitly was Bitely, Michigan, and it's here just to the south of Idlewild. And an African American who'd been working at Idlewild as a salesman was the one who started the, uh, the Woodland Park Resort. Here's the hotel that was there, the Royal Breeze Hotel. Here's one of the cabins, just like Medicine Acres. It had a series of cabins. And this photo, which I love, I found this on eBay of all places. This was the, the coffee shop and the oil station of, of, the, Woodland Park, of the Woodland Park Resort. By the way, I did buy it on eBay. I could not resist. So yes, I do own this, this old postcard now. Here's another book, uh, another book recommendation. This is a book called Traveling Black, which talks about the importance of the Green Book, but goes way beyond that. It talks about um, segregation on airlines, segregation on buses. It's an excellent book. Um, that covers really from 1900 to about 1970 by Mia Bay, another great historian. If you have grandchildren or children, there's a wonderful book about the Green Book called Ruth and the Green Book about a family in the North who travels to the South to see their grandmother using the Green Book to find accommodations. So Idlewild, Woodland Park, Medicine Acres. Now the advantage of Medicine Acres for Detroiters was the fact that it was nearby. It was much closer than going to Idlewild, which is why Detroiters often went to Medicine Acres. Now, Daisy died on January 10th, 1956. She'd had abdominal surgery and sadly died just six days later of complications. I found some wonderful descriptions of her in her obituary and death notices. One said she was busily engaged as a champion for her race, constantly filling speaking engagements for political, civic, and community groups. She was an affable and engaging conversationalist. She was a monument of hope. She's an amazing person. And I think, how come we just never know about Dr. Daisy Northcross? Well, now you do, now you do. Now, what about Medicine Acres? This is the only ad I could find for Medicine Acres. And notice, medicine is spelled wrong. But it was her daughter, Gloria Northcross, who kept the resort going. You can see this is from the Pittsburgh Courier uh, in 1961. So into the early 1960s, Gloria kept the, the resort going. Now, Gloria herself died in 1988 found some fascinating things about her. Gloria was a doll collector. She had a very elaborate collection of dolls from all over the world. And what I found interesting was that very often she would put on a doll show at JL Hudson's downtown Detroit. I was able to locate a photo of one of the Hudson's doll, one of the doll shows at Hudson's. Now, was it Gloria Northcross's collection? I have to believe it was. I mean, it was in Hudson's. You can clearly see there are dolls from across the world. So I'm kind of thinking that this was one of Gloria Northcross's doll shows in Hudson. Another interesting thing at the time of her death, she was not listed as being from Detroit. She was listed as being from Rose Center. So clearly she had moved and her place of residency was a little center near the end of her life. Now, over time, of course, the, the North Cross family sold off some pieces of the land. They still own some of it, however. The cabins, those old cabins are still within the North Cross family. But I got interested. I was curious, had any other African-American Detroiters bought land in Rose Township. Clearly, they, so many had come to visit the resort, 
I decided to find out more about the people living near Dr. Daisy North Cross. I started with Isaac Bethel. I found out he was African-American. He was born in Pennsylvania where his father was attending Lincoln University. Lincoln University was one of the first historically black colleges and universities. Now, his father is a fascinating person. I found a section of his autobiography, which begins, I was born a slave on the fourth day of May, 1844. Some of you may be familiar with the Federal Writers Project. Uh, it was a project of the Works Progress um, Administration that remember that was creating jobs um, during the New Deal. And the Federal Writers Project sent out several writers, some teachers, and they interviewed people who had formerly been enslaved in the South, hundreds of people, and then they collected their stories. And William L. Bethel, Isaac Bethel's father, was one of the people they interviewed. So his story, his story of enslavement is online. Again, I have a copy of it that I'm happy to send you. Now, Isaac himself graduated from Lincoln University in 1902. In 1902 to 1903, he was at the University of Michigan studying medicine. He dropped out, but re-entered in 1906 and was there till 1910. It appears, if I'm reading the records right, he was never able to graduate from U of M, but I'm still working on that. I learned that 1910 was a tough time for Isaac Bethel's family. He had three children, he had four daughters by then, by 1910, and the youngest one, who was only 10 months, died in 1910. So it looks like the family had some, some hardships and troubles, and that may be why he never graduated. But by 1930s, he was owning, he owned his own trucking business. And based on the, the value of his home as is shown in the census, it was a very successful business. By the 1940s, he was running a general contracting company. So he was a, a prominent Detroiter, I found out. Um, and he had purchased the land right next to Daisy North Cross. But then I wonder, did he know Daisy North Cross? Was that why he'd purchased the land? Were they connected in some way? Well, I found some evidence. This is an article about a birthday party, a surprise birthday party that some folks gave for Daisy North Cross. And attending that party was Miss Fanny Bethel, who ended up being one of Isaac Bethel's daughters. And I found other examples of social events, community events, where one of the Bethels was there and one of the North Crosses was there. But then to the North, I noticed this land was owned in the 1940s by C.S. Syfax, MD, another doctor. Oh, wait a minute, I said, I bet there's a connection. That doctor ended up being Dr. Charles Sumner Syfax. He comes from the Syfax family, which is one of the most significant African-American families in the United States. He was a direct descendant of the original Charles Syfax, who'd been enslaved by George Washington Custis, who just happened to be the grandson of Martha Washington. Charles married Mariah Carter Custis, who was the daughter of George Washington Custis, her owner, and Arianne Carter, one of his slaves. So it turned out that Dr. Syfax, who bought land in Rose, is a direct descendant of Martha Washington. There's a wonderful Smithsonian section on the Syfax family. They actually did a display recently. They produced a video on the Syfax family and all the descendants, which are just some amazing people. You can find it on YouTube. Char our Charles Sumner was a uh, uh, Syfax, was born in 1902 in Washington, DC. And that was because his father was a, the dean at Howard University. Not only the dean, but a brilliant mathematician and a professor of mathematics. <laughs> 
Charles Syphax graduated himself from U of M Medical School in 1924 and began a medical practice in Detroit. I couldn't find out much about him, but I did find that he did conduct a lot of free health clinics there in Detroit. Now you've noticed me using newspapers. I have to tell you, the Detroit Free Press and the Detroit Times were pretty useless for this research. It was as if the Bethels and the Syfaxes and the North Crosses did not exist. I was dependent then on these newspapers, these two, the Michigan Chronicle and the Detroit Tribune. Why? These were African-American newspapers. That was where I found most of my information. Both of these have been digitized now. The Michigan Chronicle can be found at the Library of Congress site. Detroit Tribune is at newspapers.com or newspaper archives. Unfortunately, both of those are subscription services, but finally we are finding digitized African-American newspapers. Dr. Syphix died in 1983. I wasn't able to find, sadly, uh, uh, an obituary for him, but they obviously had a nice memorial service. And now I was wondering, I needed proof that he did know Daisy Northcross. Well, here it was. Remember the surprise party where Miss Fanny Bethel was there connecting the Bethel and the North Crosses? Well, Marjorie Syfax, Charles' wife, was there also. So clearly they were connected but one even cooler connection. This is 99, this is 59 King Street. King Street is right off of Woodward. This was the home of Charles Syfax. Right across the street is 50 King Street, which just happened to be the home of Daisy Northcroft. So not only did they own property right near each other in Road Center, but they also lived right across the street from each other. Well, now over time, of course, all of them began to sell pieces of, of the land off. Here's an interesting thing. A very famous Detroiter bought some of the Syphex land and some of the North Cross land. That happened to be George W. Crockett Jr. I've always been fascinated by him. You know, he was a lawyer, a jurist, an important judge, he was a congressman and an incredible civil rights activist. Uh, he ended up spending time in Rose Center also. Here's my last book suggestion. There's a new book coming out. In fact, it, it isn't going to be uh, released until February 24th this year, but a new book about George Crockett. The initial reviews have been excellent, and I know I intend to read this one. So we have a group of farmers who were so strongly believers that slavery was wrong, that they got involved in an illegal movement, the Underground Railroad. And we had Henry Jenkins, who most likely was enslaved as a very young person in Alabama and found his final resting place in a little cemetery in Northern Oakland County. And then Medicine Acres, an African-American resort listed in the Green Book that was tucked away in Tiny Rose Center. Now here's the reality. They are all unfinished stories. I have so many questions about all of them. So my work is just beginning and hopefully I'll be able to find out more and find out additional information for each of these stories. Well, now, before I open it up for questions or comments, let me invite you to the next Fireside Chat, which will be Tuesday, March 15th, where I'm going to be talking about amazing women who are part of Oakland County Parks history. I, again, series of wonderful stories. One final invitation. We are bringing back our tea parties in the Ellis Barn. Um, we did these a few years ago. They are great fun. They were very, very popular. And of course, the pandemic squished the tea parties. Well, we're bringing them back uh, June 14th, 15th, and 16th.
You can find information online and Sandy will put in the chat room a phone number you can call if you'd like to register. Also, here's my email. This is the email you can get the easy, most easily at. So if you have a question uh, after tonight that you, know, you want to ask later or something comes up, or you'd like the, um, the Lisette book, or you'd like the William Bethel autobiography, just send me an email. I'll be happy to forward the stuff to you. Now with that, let me stop sharing and let me open it up for questions or comments. Well, hello, Harley Berger. <laughs> Another friend here. Any question? It's a lot of information, I know. You kind of have to process it. I didn't mean to be rude, but I'm not sure if my sound is working. Can you hear me all right? Now we can hear you. Now you can hear me. Okay. Well, that's yeah. Good. I did want to say hello, that's all. Okay. Well, hello, Harley. Hello. Very good. Fine presentation as always. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody with a question? I see Judy Hauser there, another friend. It's hard sometimes, you've got so much there. You probably had a question about the Underground Railroad and then it got trapped between Henry Jenkins and Medicine Acres. And... But you can see there's lots, lots to be learned. Don't be shy. Don't be like my Oakland University students. Thank you. Uh, I think that's I... my friend Mora. I, I understand that that uh, the house on uh, what was the Pontiac Trail there up, up at uh, Orchard Lake? What was that again? The Emmendorfer House. Yes, that's owned by a publisher now or a former publisher now, isn't it? That's what I heard. I heard it was owned. It, yes. Somebody new was owning it, and I'm hoping um, it's not that people are doubting that it was involved. It's that the documentation needs to be more more documentation needs to be done. It's really tricky. Some of you may be familiar with the Moses Wisner house in, in Pontiac. There's always been uh, legends that that was involved in the Underground Railroad. It would make sense. It's a big house. It was along the San, uh, Saginaw Turnpike. Moses Wisner was a very strong abolitionist, very strong. So it would make sense. Um, but right now, the, just, we can't find the documentation. Anything else? Uh, are you familiar with the Philbrook Tavern uh, in Farmington? Yes. Now, the documentation, I, that has strong documentation. That, in fact, someone um, recently asked me if I had something, and I was able to locate that again in a family record specifically said they were involved. So that one, I, I would think that one has strong evidence. I, I, there is a historic marker out front of the place. It was a yes. former roadhouse and tavern. It's a very impressive house, actually. I it's, believe it's yes. at the corner of Powers and uh, 11 Mile. I think so. Right. And, and the, the people had connections to Powers. You know, one of the ways you document the, the sites on the Underground is who they knew. Who were their, their friends? What church did they belong to? Presbyterians, Congregationalists were often the, connected to the Underground Railroad uh, because of the sentiments of the church. And then you looked at their political affiliation. Um, people who belonged to the Republican Party were way more likely to be involved than someone in the Democratic Party uh, in, in the 1850s. So those are the things you look at. And uh, I've been doing a lot of work in, uh, in the Oakland County Anti-Slavery Society and who attended those meetings. We're finding a wonderful little hotbed of abolitionists within Rose and White Lake Township to the extent that they were in a Presbyterian church and they pull away and they form their own church. It's the Garner family. Um, the Garners have a young African-American woman living with them. He's a super strong abolitionist. And right now we're finding that he was involved with the, with the Refugee Society, which was a, 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 a connected with the Underground Railroad. We're hoping that the White Lake Cemetery where the Garners are buried, we're hoping to 
um, get that on the National Registry for the Underground Railroad. Well, thank you. This went over time, but I'm so glad you stuck with me. Um, I hope to see some of you in March uh, for that next one. And then there'll be one more in April. And I'll be talking about uh, towns that are no longer there. Towns that were near our parks that have disappeared over time, like Little Hicksville. Uh, I'll be talking about towns that are no longer there. So thank you, everybody. Make sure if you have a question that comes up, don't be afraid to send me an email. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Good night.